Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another Quarantine Sunday, and today is going to be the last sermon for our quarantine series. And after this, we're going to go back to our exp uh, expository or uh, exegetical sermons. Um, but today, uh, I was praying about what to preach, and there were so many things that went through my head. But um, one of the things that really, really struck me is the fact that quarantine is really a time of self-reflection. You see, during this time, either you have more more time or you're more busy, right? Quarantine season either gave you more time or gave you more responsibility. If you have more time, it reveals your priorities. If you're more busy, then it reveals your securities or sources of security. And the reason I bring that up is because during this time when it's quarantine, it's supposed to really help us reevaluate our lives. And I've seen this happen with so many people. People are saying things like, oh, I realized uh, I really didn't need this job or the job that I, I had wasn't really right for me or now I'm really pursuing my passions and all of that. So a lot of people are realizing so many different things about themselves during this quarantine season. And one of the things that I hope and pray that we would reflect on is our biblical manhood and womanhood. Are we biblical in our manhood? Are we biblical in our womanhood? So um, this is going to be an, accept, uh, an exception to our usual series. Normally, we do expository sermons. Today, we're going to do a kind of a textual, topical kind of sermon as our um, final sermon for the quarantine series. And what's happening right now is that a lot of people don't know what it means to be a biblical man or a biblical woman. And I know that sounds strange, especially if you're a Christian listening to this, but hear me out for a bit. A lot of Christians say, oh, I'm a Christian and I'm a, I'm a male, so I'm a Christian man. But when it comes to what does it mean to be a biblical man, not a biblical woman, but a biblical man, what does it mean to have a biblical manhood perspective? And a lot of men shrink back. They don't know how to answer. They're not sure how to say things. They'll say, oh, well, I'm just a guy who's obedient to the word. Am I not a biblical man? Well, yes, you are. But being a biblical man and having an understanding of manhood to be biblical are two different things. You see, so many times we miss the mark of biblical manhood and womanhood because we don't have a picture or a vision of what that is. It's not clear in our minds. We're usually lost in translation because the picture isn't clear. So here's what we're going to do today. I'm going to preach and talk about biblical manhood and womanhood as a kind of summary or overview. Now, I'm going to talk about manhood first. And ladies, while you're, ad while you're listening and while I'm addressing the men and you're listening, please do listen. Watch out for these qualities. Look out for these qualities in the men in your lives. If you have men in your lives who have these qualities, then you count yourself blessed. Encourage the men who have these qualities to continue to persevere, to fight for these qualities, to make them grow even more, and vice versa. When we start addressing the women, then the men who are listening, look for these qualities in women in your life. Count yourself blessed if the women around you, the women in your life, have these qualities. Now, if you're single, especially if you're single, then start thinking about these qualities as your standards for a, a personal uh, or partner, a spouse, a, a personal kind of standard for for who, who would you want to marry, the kind of lady or man you would accept in your life as a potential husband or wife. Now, we're going to go straight right in. I'm going to talk about the men first. You see, the world has an agenda. The agenda is to strip away biblical manhood one layer at a time. And that's why today we have so many issues about men. We've got things like toxic masculinity. But masculinity itself is never talked about. Whenever masculinity is brought up, it's always under the, the assumption that it's toxic. And then we've got uh, this, the, the, the people saying, oh, men should get in touch with their feminine side. You know what, men? My, my dear brothers, we're men. If you think you got in touch with your feminine side, you have to repent because you don't have a feminine side. We are men. And so as men, we behave like men. We honor God as men. And it doesn't mean that we should never be vulnerable. It means we may be vulnerable as men, but we are men. We don't 
play around with or try to touch or be some kind of a feminine a feminine side kind of a guy that's not what we are that's not what we're called to be or to do media and entertainment always portray men as either silly to be laughed at or overly ambitious in an evil way and i don't know if you've noticed it but watch sitcoms take a look at the modern entertainment look at how men are usually portrayed compared to women we've got so many movies so many a uh, netflix shows that showcase this now this is something that has to be addressed you see we have to start looking at ourselves as fathers as brothers as sons who have a greater role and a greater call when we listen to moses when when god spoke to the people through moses god said that he will punish the next generations the third and fourth generations of those who do not follow him what does that mean a lot of pentecostals today call it the generational curse now it's not a generational curse in the sense that it's kind of supernatural what it does mean is this they used to live a very long life their lifespan before was so uh, long and so lengthy that you could live to see your second third and fourth generation and you'd still be alive you would because they married young and they lived long and so that means the kind of example that men leave will have a lasting impression and influence on the next 2 3 and 4 generations it's a cycle a man who shows great godly examples to his children will pass it to his grandchildren and great grandchildren and great great grandchildren etc The Bible gives us that promise. Train up a child in a way he should go and when he goes grows older, he will not depart from it. So we don't need more of this whole toxic masculinity and uh when we talk about toxic masculinity, this this refers to weak men. Men without conviction, men who are so afraid, cowardly men, lazy men, unproductive men, and men who are so in touch with their feminine side, you're not even sure if they're still men. First Kings chapter 2 verse 2 to 4 is actually um David giving final instructions to his son and he says this I'm about to go the way of all the earth be strong and show yourself a man keep the charge of the Lord your God walking in his ways and keeping his statutes his commandments his rules and his testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn that the lord may establish his word that he spoke concerning me saying if your sons pay close attention to their way to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart and with all their soul you shall not lack a man on the throne of israel so king david is saying we must show ourselves as men to be strong to keep the law of god to study the word what we need is not these toxic masculinities these weak cowardly men fearful lazy unproductive feminine men what we need is the opposite we need real biblical masculinity we need men who are strong full of conviction and zeal courageous not afraid to work long and to work hard we need men who are productive truly masculine selfless not caring about ego or glory and caring more about loving others leading others serving others mentoring other men to be men worthy of respect worthy of admiration the bible says in proverbs as iron sharpens iron so must brothers men sharpen other men brothers sharpen other brothers fathers should sharpen other fathers we must do that for one another for the sake of god's glory and our own sakes as men we need men who are capable of making commitments noble commitments and keeping them men who are reliable worthy of trust faithful we need men who aspire admirable projects and goals and to actually have the guts to pursue them to dare to dream the difficult dreams men who value excellence in everything they do when people say ah oh, that's good enough We need men to say that's not good enough if it's for God it has to be excellent. We must have standards for each other and for ourselves to become men who respect and protect women, who value women, who uplift women, who are true brothers to their sisters. Men who work hard at their jobs, 
We need men who can take criticism from others and not be afraid to think critically and objectively. We need men who can, who can take the hits and say, you know what? It's okay. I can take this because I'm a man. I can think critically. I will be objective and I will grow and I will improve. We need men especially who are willing to sit and study under a small light and open their Bibles and open their commentaries and open those theology books, those books heavy on doctrine and to pour their hearts and minds into that study. And we must have men who can pray as men. We need men who can pray these prayers, the prayers that say, Oh God, teach me to be strong. Teach me to be honest and full of integrity. Show me the ways of courage and conviction. Grant me the faith to resist temptations, to slay the dragons of lust, laziness, and pride. As Christian men, we don't need to compare ourselves to the world. We don't need to compare ourselves to how much the next guy is earning or how, how many girls the next guy, the, the other guy has or how many, uh, how, how much money is in your bank compared to the next guy. We don't need that. We don't need the praises of this world. We need only one thing, the words from our king, well done, good and faithful servant. Men today are lost in the mud of this fallen world. As men, we don't need entertainment. We don't need more. We have so much entertainment already. You know what? If you take a look at why men leave church and why men stay in church, a lot of men stay in church not because of the entertainment, why do you think a lot of men stay in church? Because they want to be challenged. We want to be engaged. Give us doctrine. Give us theology. Stop treating us as women. Treat us as men. Challenge us. As men, we need marching orders. You know, it's innate in all of us to conquer our failings, to rise up and to keep rising. Why do you think men of the world love video games? Because men want adventure. We have an innate need to unlock skills, to charge hills, to plant flags, and to have noble deaths. That's the kind of manhood that's missing in the world today. The Bible calls God his, our, our banner. The Bible says, the Lord is my banner. You know what that means? The banner? This is a wartime symbol. In the old days, when people went to war, they used swords and shields and they would clash and clang and they would fight in the mud and the dirt and they would fall and blood and sweat would get into their eyes. And many times, the sound is so loud, you can't hear anymore where the captain is. Wherever your captain is and where your general is or where your king is. And when your king says, over here, and you can't figure it out because your ears are ringing. You don't know where the sound is coming from. When the king says, charge here, you don't know where here is. When the king says rally to me, you don't know where the king is when he says rally to me. So what happens? The king has a flag and it, the flag or the banner stands high. So as soldiers, as knights, we fall down, we get back up, we hear our king say rally to me. We don't know where the voice is coming from. We look around and we see that banner and that is where we fight towards. We charge towards that direction to our king. And that is why in the Bible, the Bible says, God is my banner. He is the, he is the man. He is the person. He's the king, the God, the deity that we worship. And he is the one that we run to, we rush to, and we fight hard to get to where he is. And that's for all men. And I know it sounds like a tough order. I know it sounds like a tall order, a challenge. But you know, as men, and I know when, I, when I'm speaking here right now, and if you're a man and you're listening to this, man to man, brother to brother, I know there's a part of you that says, challenge accepted. I know there's a part of you that says, this is scary. This is going to be tough. I have a lot of struggles in my life. There's so many things that I lack. Maybe you can say, oh, I don't have a, an example of a godly father figure in my life. Or I don't have godly men around me. Or maybe um, you've, you've been through so much or you never had really an example of what it means to be a man of scripture. But that's fine. That's what the church is for. That's what brothers are for. Brothers in the faith. We can be there for one another, encourage one another and have men's group, men's group chats and all of that. And we can encourage one another. Now, ladies, if you're listening to this, I'm sure... There's a part of you that just says, Amen. 
You want to have those kinds of men in your life. Men who will respect you, love you, protect you, treat you like sisters, and look upon you with, with a kind of brotherly affection that says, we will protect you and watch over you and we are there for you as men. And that's not to- toxic masculinity. That's biblical, honorable, noble masculinity. And I'm sure all the ladies who are listening right now are saying, oh, I agree, amen. Now, ladies, let me talk to you to you, and let me address you for now as well. And men, please listen to this too. Because we must all hold each other to such standards. The plague on men is the toxic, unbiblical masculinity. The plague on women is worldly, perverted feminism. That's what we see in today's version or today's centuries uh, version of feminism. The feminism before, when, when feminism started or began, it was good. It was noble. It was fueled by godly, noble ideals and principles, biblical principles. But feminism has not evolved. It has devolved. Now, if you just Google the word feminism and click on images, and you're going to see some very disturbing images filled with anger, victimhood, and immodesty. It's just terrible. True feminism has degraded into some kind of social agenda that is actually destructive and harmful towards women. And the world until now is still attacking women. Let me talk about how. The world keeps bombarding women to be everything else except women of God. Dear sisters, there is something precious and mysterious about your femininity. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 3 says this, or 3 to 6 says this, Your beauty should not come from outward adornment such as braided hair or gold jewelry or fine clothes, but from the inner disposition of your heart. The unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in God's sight. And I tell you, ladies, not just in God's sight. These traits are precious in our sight, in men's sight as well. This is the kind of beauty that men would go, wow. This is the kind of beauty where where men would say, oh, I admire that quality. It is not outer appearance. Now, look at verse 5. For this is how the holy women of the past adorned themselves. They put their hope in God and were submissive to their husbands just as Sarah obeyed Abraham and called him Lord. And you are her, her children if you do what is right and refuse to give way to fear. Dear sisters, dear ladies, your femininity is a treasure. We know this to be true. Because you are also made in the image and likeness of God. So guard your hearts and be women of modesty and virtue and nobility. The world will tell you that your value and worth is found in your sensuality and your sex appeal. And as a Christian woman, you will say you disagree with the world. Like th- th- there's a part of you that will say, Amen, you know, that the world is wrong. But, but ladies, admit it or not, deep down, you're bothered. Deep down, there's a part of you that's still tempted to compare yourself to other girls. And for some reason, and I know this because we see the magazines on the bookstores, in national bookstore, we see the covers of the magazines. We, 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 we hear the comments of other girls about other girls. It's always a competition. Who has the smaller waist, the longer legs, the smoother skin, the rounder this or that, or the slimmer this or that, or the longer nose, or the... My goodness, it's not about that. We've seen and we've, we've witnessed how tragic this can be to the understanding of young girls about themselves. We see how, how many girls even force themselves to vomit just to stay skinny or small or to keep that waist uh, or waistline. We, we see women torture themselves and agonize no matter how, how already lovely they are uh, for their physical appearance, no matter how lovely they are, they still find something wrong and they're still so insecure. And we know all this because we've seen it. Here's another irony. We've also heard women, when they witness other women do something wrong, their comments are not about what 
the other girl did wrong. The comment is usually about their appearance. When someone, when this girl does something silly, other girls don't say that thing was that that action was silly. They'll say something like, "Feeling guapa" or "Oh, she's or or in, in I don't know what that is in English. Um, uh, like, why does she do that? Does she think she's that pretty? You know, that's 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 the sentiment, and that shouldn't be the case, ladies. God the Father is calling you to something better, something deeper and more intimate than petty comparisons. That kind of worldly comparison is shallow. And you know, frankly, you're way better than that. God is calling you to rest all your security in Christ. He calls you to be, to, to be a woman of virtue. He calls you to a peaceful and quiet rest in Christ. Yes, this world is harsh. Yes, you have to work hard at your jobs. You're careful when you go home at night, and sometimes it feels overwhelming. But this is where our God and the men who serve our God should show love, respect, and protection. To be mindful of how our sisters in the Lord go home, especially at night. But you know, ladies, again, you don't need to look better than the next girl. Because having a pretty face is just that, having a pretty face. But old age will come, and then what? You know what truly lasts longer than a bikini body? It's a biblical brain. True beauty is in the faithful and loving, modest woman of virtue that transcends earthly looks. The world has blinded women to place their worth on their desirableness. The more men desire them, the more worth they see in themselves. Tragically, Girls who put their security in their sex appeal will eventually end up with men who will see them and value them only for their sex. And that's a terrible tragedy that happens every day. Sisters, listen to me. Your sexuality is not for parade. It's a promise. It's a promise to your husband. Your chastity points to your faithfulness to Christ. You give yourself only to your husband just as your heart belongs to Christ and Christ alone, as the bride is to the bridegroom. Modern feminists say women must be just as strong, violent, and aggressive as men, and then they justify it as freedom of expression. But Proverbs 31 says something different. Listen to the tone. Strength and honor are her clothing, And she can laugh at the days to come. Think about it for a moment. When it comes to men, when it comes to men, the Bible calls men to fight, to go to war, to be aggressive and to to put on the sword and the shield and to go and attack and to take that hill. But when the Bible addresses women, her strength and honor are not in her sword, not in her shield, not in fighting in the mud with blood and guts and gore. Her strength and her honor are her clothing. It's her modesty, her virtue, that she is lovely, not just outside, but lovely inside. She can laugh at the days to come. She's not fighting against the days. She's laughing at them because she's resting in Christ. Verse 26, she opens her mouth with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. What does that look like? Oh my goodness, I tell you, how many times have I praised and and thanked God for when men have fought so many battles and they fall and they get up again and they fall and they rise again and many times the men get exhausted and brother to brother, man to man, we say, let's go, let's do this. And sometimes it just doesn't work. The, The manly encouragement from brother to brother, it doesn't work. And then we hear from our wives, our sisters, and our daughters tenderly, nurturingly look at us and say, bro, you can do it. Bro, one more try. And for some reason, call it the complementary nature that God made between men and women, something just fills us up and our spirits are rejuvenated because our sisters in Christ, our sisters in the Lord encouraged us and it's so precious that that feminine strength that cannot be explained and only experienced by grace. 
Real biblical femininity is a gentle feminine strength, strong in convictions yet graceful in approach. There's passion and zeal expressed in delighting in Christ, faithfulness in the small things, in the support of her family and loved ones, in the nurturing of those God placed in her life. The godly woman takes care of herself, her mind, and her body, placing her virtue and reputation as very high priorities. Just as men are wired to lead and aspire for greatness, women are wired to be natural supporters whose feminine support is vital and crucial for the men in their lives. Dear sisters, the world needs examples of godly, modest women of virtue. Women who can be trusted with their words. Women who are faithful to godly values and godly principles. Women who inspire others with their lives and their examples. Women whose understanding of beauty transcends the outer appearance. Women who are worthy of respect because of how they live, how they speak, and how they behave. Women who study their Bibles with diligence, knowing that she may one day be a supporter to her husband, a godly mother to her children, and of course a mentor and discipler of other young girls who have been so lost for so long and so need godly ladies to teach them and guide them into Christ-centered womanhood. And we need women of prayer. My goodness, do we need women of prayer. Just as God often calls men to pray the dangerous, daring prayers, God often calls women to pray the intimate prayers, the prayers that shield their brothers and their fathers and their sons from the attacks of the devil. This quarantine season is reflection season. If you're a man listening to this, ask yourself, what is my view of biblical manhood? Am I living up to the standards that God has placed on me, not just as a Christian, but as a Christian man? Am I courageous? Am I brave? Do I stand up for what's right? Do I speak up against ungodly things? Do I resist temptation? Do I waste my time in silly, foolish pursuits? If you are a lady, and this is quarantine season, and I know it's very difficult, especially if um, your situation sometimes has been overly challenging, But if you're a lady, ask yourself, am I secure in Christ? Am I resting in an intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus? Do I see God as the source, as the true source of my deepest, most shameful insecurities? Am I a woman of virtue? Does wise instruction come out of my mouth? Does my life inspire others? As men and women of God, are we seeking to glorify God with our manhood and with our womanhood? Are we making sure we don't cause one another to stumble? If you're a man, are you protecting the hearts of your sisters in Christ? If you are a woman, Are you protecting the hearts of the men in your life? Do we all have clear biblical manhood and womanhood visions and examples in our minds? How have our values become misaligned? And how can we realign to the scriptures? As men of God, as women of God, during this quarantine season, Let's take this opportunity to do some self-reflection and let's all leave the quarantine season as more devout, more zealous, more courageous, more noble, and hopefully humbler, wiser men and women of God.